So I'm joined today by Josh Levine at Honeycomb, and we have a really interesting conversation coming up today around the use of technology in customer success teams. Josh has spent a fair amount of time at Gainsight in the past and has worked with the product over, over a number of years. So we're looking to better understand what that looks like in the context of different companies and when you really need Gainsight or a tool like that to help your CS team scale. So Josh, let's just start off with a quick introduction to your background and what you do at Honeycomb. For sure. So I'm Josh. I manage the customer success team here at Honeycomb.io, which is a developer tool team. So most of our, our end users are engineers. I've been in technical customer success for about eight years now in a few different capacities, but all like working directly with customers and making sure that they're successful with, with tools that are, that tend to ebb, ebb on the side of uh, technical. Got it. And, and you have worked previously at Gainsight as well, right? So you have kind of the insight. You tell us about what your role was over at Gainsight. Yeah, at Gainsight, I joined the professional services team and I was there for, for a few years working initially with just, with just SMBs and moving up all the way to enterprise as a technical architect. But really the, the flavor across all of them is doing implementations making sure that the t people feel comfortable with, with Gainsight as a tool and kind of building it out to their specific process needs. Got it. And let's just take a quick moment to introduce the audience to Honeycomb. So I know it's an observability platform, but what does that mean and who should care about it? Yeah, Honeycomb is, so we call it an observability tool, but it's essentially a tool for developers to check in and understand where there are problems in their production systems. So think about like engineers at Twitter or Facebook. If, if Twitter or Facebook goes down, where do they look to find the problem and solve yeah. it so that users aren't impacted super heavily? We're yeah. a tool in that tool set to help them find the source of the problem, find the bottleneck, and hopefully resolve it quickly. Got it. Got it. That's great. And so uh, give us a little bit of a sense for the company, how long it's been around, what's the scale of the business, and you know, where, where are you guys at in your journey as a startup? Yeah, we, we've been around for approximately six years now. We've grown quite a bit. We are, we, when I joined, we were probably around 40 or 50 people. We're now at about 170 people in terms of like customer size. We've, you know, when I joined, we had a customer base of, you know, maybe 10 to 20 reasonably large customers. And now we have uh, almost 200 large customers, enterprise customers, mm -hmm. and about another eight, 800 that are on a smaller scale. So now we're starting to think about scale CS as a function too. So it's, it's, it's been a really exciting journey the last couple of years at Honeycomb. Amazing. That's, that's awesome. So congratulations on that ongoing success. So, so Josh, let's talk about scalability and what does that mean in the CS context, right? So you've obviously experienced that here. You've experienced that in previous lives. Tell us a little bit about when you think about scalability from a CS context, how are you thinking about scaling up a team or the technology that supports the team? Yeah, ultimately, like this, the trick with the scaling exercise is exactly to your point of seeing like scaling both the team, but also the technology and the processes they use, and ideally at the same pace. Like it's, if you were to just scale the team linearly and just have a bunch of CSMs, but give them no tooling to actually work with customers, and they're just being given Google Sheets to manage everything, that's a giant recipe for success. Similarly, if you have the most complex data stack tons of tooling, a bunch of automation, but you only have one or two people actually working hands-on with large enterprise customers that paid a lot of money, that's also a recipe for success. So there, there's a nuance and, and, and subtlety to managing these things, these things in parallel. And it also provides feedback because ultimately the tooling is only as good as the benefits it provides to users. And if your CSMs and your users are finding no value in it, then it's also, it's, it's, it's garbage essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Great. We've got a few new folks that have just joined the, the conversation. So those of you joining for the first time, this is intended to be a conversation. Let us know where you're dialing in from. Feel free to jump in and ask your questions. If you'd like to ask the questions directly of Josh, just raise your hand and we'll open the line to you and you can ask your question directly. What were the discussion topic today really is around Gainsight implementations and when's the right time to think about that as a technology platform, just Josh's extensive experience working with that technology, but we're open to questions around generally around CS platforms and, and what does that look like? So for, for those joining in, thank you. And those that, if you'd like, we will make a recording available so that you can share that with your colleagues and others in the industry afterwards. Okay, Josh, back to you. So thank you for sharing that update on, on Honeycomb. Let me, let me dig a little bit deeper. Now, I know that you've represented your role from a technical standpoint as a CSM. Help us understand that distinction between a technical CSM and then, you know, other CSM roles. And when does it make sense to have a technical CS organization in place? Yeah, there's 
the, the word technical in front of CSM can be a really loaded one. We actually had a great conversation about this internally a few weeks ago at our company conference about like what, what, what really is the difference or the value of calling a CSM technical versus not, like in the actual nomenclature of the title. Part of it has to do with just assuring the customer that the person they're talking to is not just a shepherd of, of information, not, not to, to downplay the importance of CSMs. I obviously don't think, I obviously think they're very, very important. I'm not in the role for a reason, but the I feel like part of the problem with the current iteration of CS in the industry is that there's such variability in what CS does. There's so many subgroups in customer success that a CSM just in and of themselves left to their own devices will essentially just be, be pigeonholed into being a shepherd. Like, oh, you have a question? I know who, who, I know who to ask to answer it. Oh, you have a problem? I can point you to this person. And, and at, at a certain point few, along that pathway, the CSM is going to become extinct as a valuable contributor to an organization. So adding technical is, is not only there to assure the customer that hey, this person knows the tool inside and out. They can answer technical questions, but it, it's also to, 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 to make these conversations with people further up the food chain at these customers more, more valuable as well. Technical CSM in my mind, I guess to kind of put it plainly, is a CSM, but, but very well-rounded in all aspects of the product and the ecosystem that enables them to have really positive strategic conversations with customers. Yeah, that and that makes sense. And I, I think everybody appreciates the value of being able to connect with someone to really understand or have their questions addressed directly from a product standpoint. But just to just to clarify, is is it really, you know, a product CSM equal to a technical CSM, or is there a distinction, finer distinction there that we should draw up? I think it kind of it all depends on who you ask. If you're since you're asking me in this situation, I really don't think there there needs to be that distinction. I think even for like any CSM can become a technical CSM and, and it, it doesn't, it doesn't require that the tool that one is using is a particularly technical one. Like for instance, if your tool is like I, in, in one of my past jobs, I worked in sales enablement or rather not sales, enablement, sales compensation, apologies. Sales compensation is not super technical. It's just basic math and just putting it in front of sales enablement teams. And, but, but knowing the inside in the inside and out of the tool, knowing what the tool runs on, like the infrastructure, so that when things go, you know, when things happen and things go on fire, you know how to help troubleshoot it. Those types of things, being able to, to answer those types of questions, that makes you a technical CSM. And I think all I honestly feel like all CSMs should be leaning in that direction as their careers progress. Makes sense. Okay. Now I think, you know, in terms of like uh, the technology infrastructure required to support a CS organization, maybe let's move the conversation a little bit in that direction. So obviously you have experience with Gainside, but maybe start off with a overview of what the technical infrastructure looks like at Honeycomb or, you know, in a previous role where you helped that organization scale up, what kind of infrastructure is necessary to support a technical CSM organization? Yeah, I think the, the big one that really is the unavoidable elephant in the room when you're building out a technical CS org is good usage data. There's, there's no way, shape, or form of getting around it. You can build as much automation and processes and health scoring and et cetera, et cetera, that you want. But ultimately, the, the real health of your tool is based on how it's being used, and that can only be measured with robust usage data. That's not to say that like, the CSM team or the CS team needs to own it. And I would actually wager that in most large organizations, large and small, the CS organization doesn't solely own usage data or even own it at all, but working with your, your company, working with your organization as a whole to make sure that everyone has a common language of how users are using the tool is really, really important. And once you have that basis of an understanding with usage data, then build like getting a CS tool, like, like a, like a, like a, like a game site or getting a communication tool like intercom or some other, or gain site for that matter too, for that. Um, that all builds upon the solid base of usage. So that's that's the core of it, is making sure that you have a usage pipeline that's reliable, that's robust, that grows as you grow. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Josh. I mean, that's in fact where Immersa is anchored as well. So, you know, we kind of help CS teams take usage data from their product engineering organization and make it useful for their day-to-day -day activity with accounts. But that's obviously one data stream. What other data streams would you suggest are important in terms of running a technical CS out of CS role? Yeah, so the, I, I'd say there's a few. The The usage data is is a big one. Obviously like CRM style data. So like revenue, 
and those those types of things are really important as well. Some other some other potential streams of information is communication channels. So and that that kind of goes into a bit of a rabbit hole, which I'll I'll avoid unless there's appetite for it. But the the rabbit hole of like how people are engaging with you as a services organization. Like for instance, with Honeycomb, we use Slack very heavily. We we look for all of our enterprise accounts. We have a Slack channel with them in a, in a, as part of like a shared Slack channel and being able to get some data as best you can and how they're engaging there. That's really valuable. So for instance, if, if all, if we have actually a few examples of these at Honeycomb where all the usage data looks really, really healthy, but they do not engage with us in a healthy way, like at all, or very, very little. And so that's mainly going to be risky because the the use of data could be could be great that we could have healthy users at their at their their team but because we have no relationship and no communication with their higher ups if layoffs happen or something happens in the in industry where they just say we need to cut costs whether or not like they're using it in a healthy way a lot of these are top down decisions and if we don't have healthy communication then it, we can get surprised with churn which is like a CSM's worst nightmare being surprised with yeah. churn notice so i think communication is also a big pillar of data that you want to as best you can kind of measure. It's hard sometimes, especially with like a Slack, like a, 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 a Slack model, trying to measure that analytically can be tough, but there are ways. And even if it's as simple as a manual health score, like a, just a, a, a gut check, that's still gonna be better than nothing. Yeah, agreed. We got a couple of really good questions coming up on the chat channel. So anybody that's just joined us, please feel free to ask your questions in the chat session. We'll bring it up. So Lina asks a question on, you know, how does Honeycomb make usage data available to its success team? So what's kind of the infrastructure you put in place to support your team? Yeah, great question. So the basics of our infrastructure are all of our usage data goes into the, the Snowflake, that's our data store. That's that's done through a, a variety of tools, actually really mainly one tool, which is Fivetran. So we basically have like in-product usage data, Stripe data for all of our financial transactions and all these different origins of data. It all gets mushed into a Snowflake instance mm -hmm. using Fivetran. And then we do a whole, we, we keep all the raw data, typical conversation of ETL versus ELT, which is maybe not of interest to this group, but if there is interest, happy to talk about that. But we have all this raw data in Snowflake. We do a bunch of transformations on it to make it more consumable and make it make more sense to people using DBT and a few other tools. And then ultimately, now that we have in Snowflake, both raw and processed pretty data, we can share it out to our other tools like mm. Salesforce, like Gainsight, like Intercom through tools like DBT or like Census as well and a variety of other tools. So that's the basic data architecture. Got it. Got it. And, you know, Josh, you've talked about the value of usage data, and now you've kind of introduced an, another concept here, which is once you bring the data into Snowflake and you get to what you call pretty data, which is, I imagine, useful data, you then want to send that back out to the destination apps. <clears throat> you mentioned Snowflake, Intercom, Gainsight, I think. I think just talk, talk to us a bit about, in your examples, what you know, what's the value of bringing the data back into these applications? And in each case, like what's the use case for what audience that you're trying to support? Yeah, I'd, I'd say there's like a couple kind of tiers of it, but at a high level, at the very, I'll start at the most basic of levels. The most basic of levels is really any kind of enterprise software is going to have multiple like functions. There's going to be multiple yeah. ways that one can use the tool and just getting b even basic analytics about how people are using those core functionalities and especially using those core functionalities over time. That's going to be super helpful, especially if some of those functionalities are gated behind a paywall. So if you're, if, if, if you're a CSM at a company, I, it's a fair assumption you have pay tier or payment tiers and to get from tier A to tier B, you like, or, or the, the, the thing that makes tier B more enticing to tier A rather are enterprise features. You would want to be able to see how those enterprise features are being consumed. If they're not being consumed well, that's potentially concerning for a downgrade or a churn. So seeing how different features are used and how and who's using them is really important. The, the other side of this is that, you know, apologies, I lost my chain of thought a little bit, but the, the other side of this is that we want to be able to, oh, that's right, scale. There's the word I was looking for. We want to be able to scale this out too. So if we want to automate some of the work that CSMs have to do, and it doesn't even have to be in the form of a formal scale function, because that it's still a relatively new concept in CS, but it, just being able to take some low hanging fruit off of the CSM's plate and be able to automate outreaches that if 
someone is using the tool in a particular way that's either really good or really bad, getting those conversations going automatically through a communication tool driven by this usage data, that is super pow a super powerful tool to keep engagement high, to help scale this out so CSMs don't have to manage all these communication channels themselves. It, it really is like working with a high powered sniper, sniper rifle, like having mm -hmm. really good usage data is, it, it provides a huge amount of flexibility to you to, to, to take work like monotonous work off of CSMs. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. So, so Josh, let's let's talk about some of the tech platforms that that are out there to support CSMs with their day to day interactions and so on. Obviously, Gainsight is the the perhaps the best known, and and that you know Nick and the team there have done a phenomenal job of sort of establishing a technology infrastructure around the CS role as one of the first companies to put that in place. But share a little bit about your experience with Gainsight. When is the right time for a company to think of in terms of implementing Gainsight? Yeah, it, it, I think Honeycomb has an interesting perspective on it, not only because we've used multiple CS tools, but also while I was there, like, and, and I'm, I'm unbi unapologetically biased towards gains, I given my experience with the company yeah. working for them. The, so for a little bit of context, when I joined Honeycomb, we were a really small CS team. It was really just me and one or two other people, and it was us managing everything. And we, our CS tool was you could argue it was Salesforce, but it was Salesforce. It wasn't even really that. Let's be honest. It was there was no CS tool. We were using Salesforce as a CRM, but it wasn't a CS tool. Part one of my first jobs at Honey at Honeycomb was to go out and help find a potential tool. Gainsight, again, I un unapologetically was very biased towards them. My boss knew that I, I really wanted Gains, but given where we were at our scale, what we were trying to do. And just, you know, the, 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 our goals in the immediate future, Gainsight felt like bringing a jackhammer to like trying to nail in a small nail with a jackhammer. It felt right. oh, like we didn't need it. So we started using another tool called, called Custify. Fi, and for, for the record is, is a truly a very, very good tool. They have a, a phenomenal team at Custify and it's, it's as best I can describe really a lightweight Gainsight. It has a lot of the core functionality of Gainsight. Um, but where it, where they differ is that it's a lot easier to deploy, not to say Gainsight's particularly difficult, but it's, again, there's a lot to it. Customify was much simpler to deploy it, but it lacked a lot of flexibility, like a lot of customization. And where we found ourselves after about a year is we found a lot of value in Customify. It helped us really mold our philosophy of customer success at Honeycomb. And we got to the point where we're like, we want to do some really cool things with this usage data. We want to do some really cool things with how we interact with our customers. And it just made more sense at a maturity point, like, okay, I think this might make sense to move into Gainsight. And we ended up moving over to Gainsight and we've been with them for a few years now. So to your original question, Asim, I think like there's a maturity component of it too, yeah. but the, I think where a lot of people get, get stuck and where, where, where a lot of people pigeonhole themselves when they're thinking about deploying a customer success tool is that they're looking to a customer success tool to help build their process. And something that our COO at Honeycomb, Jeff, said that I really liked from a few years back was the, like, the tool shouldn't drive the process. The process should drive the tool. Like, mm -hmm. you, it, it's not expected that you, you know exactly how you want, want to run your CS team from a technical perspective. You don't have to know that. You, you're probably not going to know that. And part of the value of a gain site is that knowledge, that industry knowledge of what best practices are, but you should have a reasonably solid foundation of like, what are the, the, what are the core tenets? What are the core fundamentals of how we want to do CS at company A and build around that, start building processes, even if it's just in like a word doc, which is having an idea of what the processes will look like, what, what a customer journey looks like, what a customer health score looks like. And once you have those core fundamentals, the right tool will the, the 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 picture of what the right tool will be a lot clearer to you. It may be a gain site, it may be something else, but the complexity of what that looks like will guide you a lot better than choosing the shiniest thing on the shelf and hoping that that solves your problems, if, if that makes any sense. Yeah, totally. I think the, the core idea that I want the audience here to kind of understand and take away from that what you just described is, there's actually two ideas that jumped out at me. One is, First, define your process, then figure out what tool you need to support that process, not the other way around. 
Second is there are different tools for different stages of companies. So some that work for early stage companies and some that work for series B, series C companies and some that work for, for later stage. So, so I think that's, if we can maybe hone in on that question, the second part of that question a little bit, I get what, you know, you, when you started out at Honeycomb, your mindset was, okay, too early to deploy Gainsight given you were a two, three person team. But at what stage do you then make a decision and say, now's the right time for Gainsight? Is it based on number of CSMs? Is it based on complexity of process? Is it based on some other metric that I'm not calling out? Yeah, it, it would make, it would be nice if it was as simple as like the number of CSMs or the customer base or the ARR base, but really like where we, where we decided to move or like what the inflection point was for us. And what I generally recommend for folks too, is when do you start feeling friction? Like ultimately it's, it is easy, easier to visualize any, any group of tooling, any set of competitors in, on a maturity scale. Sometimes it fits, sometimes it doesn't. In CS, I think it does fit reasonably well, but I know customers of like tools like Customify that are proper enterprises and still use the, use the heck out of it and, and still love it. So it's not necessarily that. The really, the signal, to, the signal to you as a user is if I'm trying, like if I'm trying to build out the maturity of my organization, I'm trying to build out a process or build out something into this tool that I have and I can't do it, or if I do it, it seems very mm -hmm. hacky or painful. That friction, that friction is the sign to you that, okay, maybe I should be considering other options. Trying to measure it based off of some other like arbitrary metric, they will, it will likely coincide with that growth, but it, it, it's also kind of a tougher sell too, because you have to sell this to your organization. Like it's, it's a rarity that the, the person signing the check is the actual like VP of customer success. It's usually the CFO or someone in finance. And they're going to naturally ask the question of, well, why did, why did you want to, why do we want to move to a new, more expensive tool or to a different tool? Why do we want to shift, shift gears? And if you tell them, oh, it's because we have more CSMs than we did last time, they're going to raise their eyebrow and say, okay, come back to me with a little bit more. So that friction is though a much better story to tell. Got it. Got it. Okay. That's helpful. And, and so I think one of the key takeaways for me out of this conversation has been that there's flexibility available with Gainsight. And so when you reach that stage, when you does, when that flexibility becomes important to you in your processes, that's potentially one uh, one reason to consider Gainsight as, as an implementation option. Okay, I, for those of you listening in, we would love to learn more about what CS platforms you're currently using. So if you don't mind sharing that really quickly here, I think that, that would be helpful. You know, there's a follow-up question here from Michael about what's, can you share some of the specific friction that you saw at Honeycomb that's kind of building on your last response, Josh, that brought you to the inflection point where you said, okay, now we've got to invest. In, in building out a gain site based solution. Yeah, I think a, a good example, a, a good simple example actually, and again, let it be known that I, I, I'd imagine the awesome engineers at Customify have already solved this problem. So like this is the Customify of a few years ago or similar tooling, but a good example is, is this. We wanted, we have a measure at Honeycomb of called ingest pacing because ultimately Honeycomb, it's a developer tool. We, the only way we charge, like our, our pricing model is super easy to understand. It's just, we're a data engine. You send us data, the more data you send us, the more you have to pay. That's, that's like, it, there's nuance to that, but that's essentially the crux of it. And because of that, our enterprise contracts are built around you paying, Hey, I'm going to, you, you pay hundred dollars and you say, I'm going to send you a thousand events or whatever. It's more than that, but let's say a thousand events over the course of a year. And we want to measure the pace at which you're sending that data. If you're saying you're going to send us a thousand, a thousand events over the course of a year and you're pacing, oh, actually you're going to probably go through that faster. That's potentially bad. And similarly in the other direction, if you say you're going to send us a thousand events and you send us two events over six months, <laughs> that's also concerning for a different reason. So there's that dichotomy and we have a measure called ingest pacing where it's a hundred, a hundred is ideal. That means you're pacing right at the pace you should be. If you're going way too high, that's bad for one reason, way too low, that's bad for another reason. Yeah. The, the friction point, the first, I think the first sign of the crack in the armor, I guess you'd say in using the previous tool is we wanted to have a health score, a single health score that went, that was green in this band yellow in this band and red in these bands, like as it, as it di diverged further and further from a hundred, either positive or negative, we wanted it to be red. And the tooling at the time for, for Customify didn't allow for that. We had to build multiple measures. It was a very kind of, 
it was a more painful process than it had to be to do something reasonably simple, which is if it's go, if it's diverging in like increasing amounts, then go yellow or red. That and I, I go into detail about that. To mainly to show that like that alone wouldn't be and shouldn't be a reason to leave a tool like that's an annoyance, but that flavor of thing of being able to get really creative with how health scores are ca calculated with having more control over the data that we're sending into the tool and being able to ma manipulate it and do stuff with it. That was a little bit difficult in some of the smaller tools we were using Custify. And so those like cumulative friction points made us realize, okay, the questions we need to ask ourselves are we're, we're open to another CS tool, but we really, really care about data manipulation and, and being able to play around with the data that's already sitting in the tool. And we, we didn't go straight to Gainsight. We're like, okay, let's reopen, let's reopen our free agency. Let's look at, yeah. le, le, in sports terms, let's look at like the churn zeros, the, the tatangos, the, the catalysts, the game sites of the world and compare how much flexibility do these tools have from a data management perspective. And, and very clearly, and I, again, but very biasly, Gainsight is extremely powerful at that. It's the, it's, a, it's essentially an open data store that you can just do, you can do everything you want in it. It's basically a data platform. And so that was a big selling point and being able to communicate that to my higher up, to my boss, to our finance team, like here's why we're feeling friction with the previous tool. Here's why we chose to move forward with Gainsight and the, and the, the benefits it can provide us now and in the future in terms of data flexibility, that made it a really easy conversation. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, great. So for the audience, you know, if you don't mind sharing a little bit about which company you're with and whether or not you use product usage data in your CS organization, I think it would really help with the conversation that we're having here to get a better understanding of, of how teams think about this problem in their context. So, so coming back, Josh, to, to your, you know, comments here, you know, Every tool has its pros and cons, right? So when, when companies are thinking about gain sight as an option, what, what's some of the pitfalls that they should avoid? Like what are some of the gotchas that they got to look out for either, or maybe questions they should ask during the, the assessment process to determine whether this is the right tool for them. Sorry, I seen there was a bit of breakup. Could you re repeat the question one more time? Apologies. Yeah. So let's, I'm going to apply this and ask my, my first question first, which is if you are assessing CS tools. What are some of the questions to ask, particularly when you're thinking about gain site as an option? Oh, got it. So ask me of the vendors. Or, yes. Yeah. The, so there's a few. I think the for us and the one that's that's most prominent for me is that the data flexibility. So it depends obviously very heavily on the types of data you're using, but the if data flexibility or the ability to use and manipulate data in tool without having to think about without without having to pull in engineering teams is important to you, that's something that's going to be really important. Process automation, I mean, is the backbone of CS. So like automated alerts, automated health scores, automated emails, how important that is, is going to drive a lot of what tools you consider, especially that last one, automated communication, something that I think at this point, most CS tools do in some capacity is automated reach outs. They, they like gain sites um, uses SendGrid and for their, their journey orchestrator functionality. If you know that like for the near future or forever, you're going to be leaning on manual reach outs. And if you do that, then God bless you. I don't know how you're going to do it, but like, if you want to go down that route of always doing manual reach outs and, and automated communication is not that important to you. That's going to dwindle down the list of what's that, what, of what CS tools are valuable in a good way, because a lot of them have that powerful functionality, but if it's not useful for you, then why spend for it? So it really, a lot of those questions just depend on like, again, the process driving the tool, like what things process wise do you want to do on this as a CS organization in terms of usage data, health scoring, customer journey, automated outreach, all those types of things, sur surveying for that matter, although that's a whole other can of worms. Um, like how important are those things to you and how much flexibility do you have in deploying those things? Cause certain CS tools do things better than others there. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. So Josh, in terms of, let's say you've now made that selection, you're the right, you know, the, the, the it's the right fit for your company to implement Gainsight. Are there any gotchas in terms of implementation to watch out for with implementing Gainsight? Yeah. Um, not a, not a ton. The, the nice, the, the nice thing, the good, and, well, I should say the good and bad thing, the, 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 the situation with Gainsight, they, they work very heavily with implementation partners 
And so when you start working with game sites, you're basically given people like a group of people to deploy it for you. And that's either directly through game site or through their partner ecosystem, which is great. They have some great partners that we, we work with ourselves. They're, they're very knowledgeable about the product and the ecosystem. So they've kind of addressed the pain point of like any, uh, any gotchas about deploying it because you'll have someone there shoulder, shoulder surfing essentially with you to do it. But just some general process gotchas or some general gotchas about deploying game site is biting off, like just, I guess, thematically biting off more than you sh should be chewing at once. When you see what game site can do, you, you, sometimes you're like one's eyes can glaze over or they, you, your, your stomach can get bigger than what was saying you, you're, you're, your eyes are bigger than your stomach, like in, in a certain <laughs> way, like the, you, you see all these functionalities and you, you want to just go to town and just build everything. And you'll realize quickly, not only will that just take a lot of time and a lot of cycles to manage from an engineering perspective, there's, there's a fair amount of process feedback that you need. Like if you, if you see all these things that Gainsight does and you're thinking to yourself, oh, I want to do automated emails and surveys. That'd be great. Oh, and I want to start automating health scores. And oh, I want to, I want to start creating automatic tasks for people to do. A lot of these things feed on one another, like yeah. health score, health scores feed on survey feedback and mm -hmm. on, on engagement and automate task automation uh, often is like attached at the hip with health scoring and trying to do too much at once without that fair amount of time to suss it out, see how it plays out in, in your customer ecosystem, seeing if it actually helps CSMs like that, that's like waiting for that feedback to come back to you and then building on top of that, that's going to be more important. And so I guess the gotcha is like do it progressively, plan it out to give yourself time to roll these things out in stages so you can get this feedback. Because again, at the end of the day, Gainsight is a tool to make CSM's lives easier. Any CS tool is that. It's, yeah. and it's, it's easy. And, and I know better than anyone because my eye, I'm very much like that. I see all the things it can do and I get so excited and I just start building and building. And it's easy for me too, to forget that like from my little ivory tower of managing a team that Gainsight is, is not just for me to manage the customer base. It's to help my CSMs manage their customers. And if they're finding it painful or if they're finding it difficult to understand, then all of that time has been wasted because we need this tool to be a, a functional part of their day. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Very helpful. And I think, again, my key takeaway in that conversation is really focus on the processes that are relevant to you and implement those rather than get by all the possibilities that exist that may or may not be useful from, from your lens. So super helpful. Now, in terms of, you know, managing game side, like we hear, like I actually met several people who carry the title of CS operations or game side admin, et cetera. Do you need a full-time person running game side for you? Or is that in your organization? How does it work? This is one of the situations where my organization is probably not the best indicator of, of how things should be done. I think at, again, it's a question of scale at a certain scale, there is a point where you should have a gain set admin, not only because they, they know the insides of the tool, but because it's such a powerful engine. And again, for any CS tool, it, because it's such a powerful tool at a certain point, you'll, you'll need to, it's to your benefit to hand it off to someone else. That yeah. inflection, that inflection point of when you do it, that's completely dependent on the complexity of your org and a whole bunch of factors that we basically, everything we've just talked about up until this point, but there is a point at which you will need a gain site admin the, or a CS admin. And the, and it's not a reflection of gain site specifically. That's something that gain gets a lot of flack for some, some of it's justified. Some of it's not about like, you need a master's in gain site to manage it. The same can be said about like, I'll put Put it this way no one gives salesforce flack about that but salesforce is i mean i've, I've managed both salesforce is way harder to manage and like medium-sized enterprise teams having a revenue operations team no one bats an eye at that but the second you talk about cs operations oh god like it's like the world's falling apart but it, so there is there, there is a point at which you will need it why my organization is not a great example is I have a background in Gainsight. Um, I'm, I was an architect there. And so like at the scale we're at right now, I'm, I'm able myself and a few other folks that help me are able to like manage it. Cause like myself and one of our other managers, um, both have a fair amount of experience with Gainsight and we just kind of manage it together. Yeah. But even, even us a year and a half or so into using Gainsight, we're getting to the point where like, 
we have competing priorities. This is a lot of time and a lot of complexity and just a lot of stuff coming out in terms of Gainsight's ecosystem that we don't have the bandwidth to learn. And so I'm already starting to, to work with some of my CSMs and one of them is hopefully going to turn into a CS ops dedicated yeah. role in the next year. Got it. I think that context is very helpful. You know, that they do get dinged for this need for having a full-time resource. And the answer is it depends. It depends on the scale that you're at and what you're trying to solve for. Okay. So, you know, I, I want to understand a little bit better. You, you mentioned that at the beginning of the call or this conversation, you mentioned that you've established a Snowflake data warehouse that's bringing all the data in, and then you're reverse ETLing that out into multiple different data systems. How do you, what, what information or what data do you reverse ETL from that Snowflake instance into, into gain size? There's, there's a lot. There's, there's like data around specific uses of like pro specific product features. So like in game, in Honeycomb, there's a bunch of feature functionalities on top of the core functionality and seeing how those are used over time. So both like current snapshot and rolling averages of usage of those things. We, because our tool is essentially a query functionality, like it's the, it's a data engine, but the tool is only as useful as how you're asking it questions. So we have a lot of interesting analytics that we push up through reverse ETL to our, to gain set and other tools about what types of questions they're asking of the tool. Like it's not a simple point and click and you say, here's, here's the data you have to, it's a, it's a data manipulation engine. So there's a lot of ways to ask questions and understanding what those flavors look like over time. We, we push all of that up to, to, to Gainsight. There's the basic stuff that we talked about in the past around like how much data they're sending us or their ingest, what types of data they're sending us. That's also an interesting question. And we're getting more and more granularity around that. So yeah, those, those are the general flavors. Got it. And, you know, I mean, obviously Gainsight has the ability to ingest data from a variety of different data sources. Is there any advantage to bringing a data through Snowflake into Gainsight or directly into Gainsight? Like what are the pros and cons of each approach? Yeah, it, it, it's just a question I think of, of I think it's like both a question of data flexibility and that, that term data flexibility, but also who's managing this manipulation. So in terms of data flexibility, Gainsight is very, very flexible, but at the end of the day, would I compare it to the levels of like Immersa or, D, or DBT or census or like tools that are purpose built for working with data, mm -hmm. I, I probably wouldn't like they're, they're just naturally it's like, it's a game site does a whole lot of things really well, but I wouldn't put it up against the likes of DBT, for instance, in terms right. of its flexibility. Right. And then second to that is again, like who's going to manage that right now, the RCS team for better, or for worse at Honeycomb, we, we, we manage a lot of this. A lot of this is under our auspices, but we have like, uh, as part of our revenue operations team, we have a data analyst who's much better than I am or any of us in terms of manipulation and just general data cleanliness. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to want to live in gain site. That's not really their, their thing. They want to live in Snowflake and DBT and like data tools. So if they're going to be managing it long-term, it probably makes more sense to generalize it to that point. Oh, and one other additional one that I thought of is we're not the only ones at Honeycomb CS that use this Snowflake instance. We like my, my previous, my, my, my previous boss at Honeycomb, who's still here, Irving, who helped build all of this. Like a lot of this is his brainchild, the Snowflake instance. Even though he was the driving force behind this like really robust data ecosystem, he, we're not the only ones that use it. Like our, our sales and marketing teams, our, our entire field organization uses this data heavily. Even our engineering team leverages it sometimes to manage their understanding of how new users adopt the tool. And so it, the, as, as adoption of this data beast grows, it makes more and more sense to generalize ownership of it, to generalize like where things are done to a wider audience. If we did all this in Gainsight, it would get clunky really fast because again, it's not, it's not purely a data tool and trying to have other people come in to help manage it. It's, it's not a problem yeah. to solve. <laughs> Yeah. So I think the key, again, you know, I, I try to look for that one core insight in the responses that, you know, our guests bring here. And what I'm hearing is that you're looking to syndicate that data to a variety of different destinations, not just to gain sight. And you're better off doing that through one common infrastructure. And those, that infrastructure is built on tools like Immersa, or if you're a do-it-yourself kind of person, then DBT or census and so on which lets you manipulate the data in ways that Gainsight doesn't. Is that, is that kind of a fair assessment? 
Exactly. For sure. Okay. Got it. Very cool. Okay. I think, so this has been a phenomenal conversation. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. I think I've learned a lot about how to work with Gainsight, when to use Gainsight, when to think about investing in Gainsight in, in, in a meaningful way and in, in, in what way. You know, if, there, if our audience has questions, if people want to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to find you? And are you open to sharing some of your experiences and insight about customer success, te technical customer success, gain sight with, with the folks who are curious to learn more? Yeah, I mean, at, at the end of the day, I think the easiest way for all of us to communicate in CS is LinkedIn. That's kind of the backbone of, yeah. of, of our space. So feel free for anyone now or listening to this in the future, feel free to reach out to me in, in, on LinkedIn. I'm happy to chat. There are a, a lot of great CS communities out there in Slack as well that I'm happy to introduce people to where people much smarter than me can give even better insight about this kind of thing. But first things first, ha happy to, to chat by it. Great, great. Josh, thank you so much for your time. Josh, please stay on for the audience. We're going to drop off now and wrap up the webinar. If you have any questions about Dorsa or if you have, if you'd like to contribute to this conversation in the future, please reach out to me directly at a seam at immersa.co. And our goal here is to learn more about how various teams are using data to drive their business. And in particular on the, how customer success teams are using data to drive their business. So we're always interested in that conversation. Thank you all for your time. And we'll look forward to seeing you next week in a equally exciting conversation with a, a different guest each week. So I look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you for, for joining us today.